Thank you. It always seems like there's a lot of pent up need to connect. I, sitting up here, I like to hear. I like it's like bees buzzing in the room or something. I, I really like it. So thank you. I started out with Zen many years ago, and I remember um, going to various Zen centers and sitting on my cushion facing the wall and nobody was saying anything and nobody was looking at me and and nobody had really explained what was going on with that and it felt very lonely um you know it it changed over the years but um especially for for our person who's new i think it's um for me anyways it's helpful to feel not so isolated really uh, i think shelly likes to talk about uh the practice being a relational practice Although I think the images of people sitting silently on their cushions and really not being very relational, but it is very much relational. So um, thank you for playing along. So I thought I'd describe what I had planned to do tonight and we'll see how that sits and we'll, we'll start in. So um, we can start with a uh, some sitting meditation or if you choose to, you can always lie down. Uh, or you can stand up or, you know, assume any posture that you, you want to assume. As you probably know, uh, you know, they said that there are four postures for meditation, sitting, lying down, standing, and walking. So choose whichever suits your body tonight. And it is, it's Wednesday, right? It is Wednesday night, which is a so I was just talking to somebody earlier and they said, oh gosh, I could never do that thing on Wednesday night. I'd fall asleep. So maybe that's you tonight. Um, if you can try to stay awake, that's great. But if you need to sleep, well, it's the way it is. So we'll do a, um, a guided meditation, slightly guided. I'll start out guiding and then some silence at the end. And then we'll just take a few minutes to stretch our bodies. For those on Zoom, it's good to look away from the camera and uh, look to other parts of the room also to stand up if you if you choose to. Uh, then I'm going to offer some reflections, uh, which will be mercifully brief. <laughs> and um, I would love to hear your reflections as well on uh, what I'm going to speak about um, and anything else you'd like to offer. I'm very much of the school that I am not the sage on the stage here. I'm just facilitating our being together. So I welcome your comments and your own comments about your own experience. This is really what this is about. Uh, depending on how much time we have, then we may do another guided meditation around what I'm offering or not. Um, this is ambitious, then um, I would love if we could chant the Metta Sutta, the Buddha's words on loving kindness. It seems um, enormously important to put that out into the, uh, into the world, given the situation that we're in. And then I'm going to end with a... Uh, a prayer from Shir Tikva, which is a synagogue in Minneapolis. So that's the plan. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Any questions, objections, anything else you'd like before we begin? Looking at Zoom, don't see any. Okay, so I, I would invite you to find a comfortable posture, whatever that is, for some sitting meditation. And as always, if it becomes uncomfortable, then you can shift wherever you need to. And I'll start with the sound of the bell. So settling into the body. Be 
feeling the weight of the body sitting. Feeling the contact with whatever you're sitting on or lying on. Feeling the contact with the ground, with the earth. Arriving. Arriving in this body. In this place. In this time. And feeling the breath in the body. The breath coming into the body and the breath leaving the body. Allowing the mind and the body to rest in the soothing rhythm of the breath. Allowing the breath to be deep or shallow, fast or slow. Making space for the breath to be however it is in this moment. Each breath bright and new, different from the last.
the movement of the breath moving through the relative stillness of the body. Like the wind moving across the solidity of the earth. movement within stillness. And now if you choose letting the breath recede into the background of your awareness and bringing into the foreground whatever else is available to your attention, perhaps strong sensation in the body, thoughts moving through the mind, emotions, sounds in the room. becoming available to whatever is to be known. And as you do so, you might choose to put a smile on your face. Both a signal to the brain that everything is okay. And also a sign of welcome to your experience. Welcoming whatever may be present, whether it be pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant or unpleasant. Welcoming it all. So sitting together now in silence, resting back and down into the solidity of the body and the rhythm of the breath. And opening if you choose to the vast spaciousness
and the miracle of things arising and passing away moment by moment. If the mind has wandered, gently bringing it back to this body, to this breath, to this moment.
And now if you choose, taking a moment to widen your awareness to include the space around you. If you're on Zoom, the virtual space that connects all of you. And if you're sitting in this room, the space that holds our bodies in this physical location. Feeling into the space around you. If you're in this physical space, making sure to include the Zoomers. And if you're on Zoom, reaching out, including the space in this room. So sensing into that space. And all of these like-minded beings that are sitting in the space, all of us who have come here tonight to practice the path to freedom. Sensing into that space and feeling the support And as you do so, if there's something that you would like to offer yourself tonight, something that you need, perhaps love or compassion, patience, equanimity, whatever comes to mind, breathing in that quality for yourself on the in-breath, breathing it in. And on the out-breath, offering it out to everyone here tonight, both in this physical space and in the virtual space. Breathing in something for yourself and breathing out to the others. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out to the others. And before we end, if you'd like to include other beings in this well-wishing, beings that you may know personally or not know, Beings who may also be in need of this quality that you've offered yourself and the others in this room. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out to the others. May we all know peace. May we all know freedom. Let's take a moment to stretch, if you choose, in whatever way makes sense to you. So how is everyone? Okay. okay. It's so nice to be here. I really miss this. Kind of brings tears to my eyes. I shouldn't put my hand on the microphone, sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I really struggled with what I could offer that might be of help. And I'm going to I'm going to be looking at notes. I have an old brain and um I it needs some assistance. So I want to make sure that I speak clearly. So I'm gonna be looking at my notes. Um these seem to be I, I don't have words to describe it. Um I heard Ajahn Pasano, the uh, the abbot of Abagiri, uh, he led Madison uh, Vipassana retreat 
last weekend, the weekend before. Anyways, he described it as sad times. Thought that was a pretty good description. And so I, uh, I wondered what I could say. Um, and then I remembered that that wasn't actually the point, that the point was to be with like-minded people and that that was, was really enough to be with uh, spiritual friends as we're called, that that, that that is the path forward, that I don't really actually have to say anything. And maybe you felt that. I felt it tonight, just sitting here with all of you. As the Buddha taught Ananda, his, uh, his attendant and his cousin, actually, uh, he said, spiritual friends are not just part of the path. They are the whole of the spiritual path. I think that's so interesting. Spiritual friends are the whole of the spiritual path. And just remembering that um, really soothed my heart. Um, that again, that that it's enough just to be here practicing together. So one of my favorite teachers is someone called Tanisra. Does anybody know Tanisra? Yeah, some do. Yeah, uh, she's she's great. She's well worth looking into. She was a um, a nun in Ajahn Chah's uh, monastery in Thailand. Ajahn Chah was the probably the foremost uh, teacher in the Thai forest tradition of the last century. She was an, a nun there, and uh, she's British. And she kind of she got sick of the misogyny and the treatment of women. And um, she disrobed. And when she disrobed, she took with her one of the monks, uh, Kitasaro, and they got married. And they lived for many years in uh, South Africa, where they founded a retreat center. Uh, she's now lives in this country. She lives in uh, Sevastopol with Kitasaro. She has an online sangha. And uh, she, her hair is on fire. I don't know how else to describe it. She writes very powerful uh, Dharma talks. And she wrote uh, something recently on the Israeli-Palestinian war, which I highly recommend. Uh, and in the end, she talked about the importance of friends, spiritual friends. This is what she said. The hope I feel is from friends from both sides who are deeply impacted, who are committed to holding nonviolence and are holding compassion for it all. Holding and standing up for the humane and empathetic across boundaries and histories is where we grow the seed of hope, but more importantly, forge a path of peace holding and standing up for the humane and the empathetic across boundaries and histories is where we grow the seed of hope, but more importantly, forge a path of peace. So um, when I read that, I thought, well, maybe I could talk a little bit about how we might cultivate uh, a, a sense of peace, this path of peace internally so that we're be better able to stand up for peace externally. And as she said, hold and stand up for the humane and the empathetic. So my hope is that, um, that you'll offer your own reflections on this after what I have to say. So Matthew Ricard, if you know Matthew Ricard, he's a, he's a living, uh, French Tibetan monk. Uh, he's a great photographer. He's taken many photographs of Tibet and uh, other places. He was a pretty well-known scientist before he gave it all up and became a monk. And his mother is now a nun. <laughs> I like that. Anyways, uh, he uh, he wrote a recent blog um, in which he's, uh, he wrote a blog post in which he said. We must never forget that there can be no external disarmament without inner disarmament. 
We must never forget that there can be no external disarmament without inner disarmament. And I think that what he was talking about uh, was not only about disarming our hearts, our minds against those whose behaviors we find abhorrent, but also disarming our hearts and minds against our own suffering, the ways that we might do violence towards ourselves. I'm kind of familiar with that myself. Maybe you are too. And I, I used to, so I, one of the things that I, I like to do, I, um, I teach the mindful self-compassion class here and elsewhere with Jane Roundhorse. We're going to start tomorrow, actually, uh, teaching it. And, um, and I, so I thought that this disarming our hearts and minds against ourselves. Uh, meant that when I got lost in self-critical thoughts or difficult emotions, that it was a matter of bringing my attention back to the breath and um, offering myself compassion in various ways that we teach in the class. But lately, I've... Um, I've come to understand inner disarmament in kind of a different and perhaps a deeper way. And I, it's taken me a long time, I think, to really understand this. And, and in my experience, this making peace internally requires a surrender to the what I'm calling and others call this felt sense of suffering. So the the kind of the raw the visceral the energy of despair of anger of hatred of all of those things that um, cloud the mind and cause suffering and the felt sense is really quite different from um, noticing self-critical thoughts and turning the attention elsewhere. So I, I like to, to mention my teacher, so I'm going to mention another one here, Anam Tupton. If you know Anam Tupton, he's a Tibetan teacher who um, lives in lives and teaches in California. And he gives the simple instruction to feel the exhaustion of your suffering. I think that's such an interesting idea to feel the exhaustion of your suffering. Because if you actually do connect to the felt sense of despair or fear or hatred, it's exhausting, in my experience, anyways. So this is. This is not a cognitive or an intellectual exercise. It's actually something else entirely. And I, I think it's what Shelley was talking about last week, if I understood her. It's the practice of being intimate with the embodied experience, or the, including the energy of our suffering. I don't talk about energy much in this, in this tradition of Buddhism except in the Thai forest tradition, but energy is not a word that's used a lot. It's used a lot in Tibetan traditions, but um, I think it's really, really important to pay attention to because our suffering has a certain energy and our, we need to, to experience that and make peace with it to understand it. So this is the first noble truth. There is suffering. We experience it. And there's a corollary to that, that it is to be understood. Dukkha is to be understood. Suffering is to be understood. I'm using the word corollary here. It's kind of a weird word, but um, you may know that there, you probably all know that there are four noble truths. That was the, was the first teachings of the, of the Buddha. And each of those four noble truths has what are called three insights or three, I heard Ajahn Pasano call them duties or responsibilities or ways that we 
achieve a deeper understanding of that truth. So one of the responsibilities or duties around the truth that there is suffering or dukkha is that we are to understand it and not just understand it in an intellectual way. Oh, yeah, there's suffering. But to actually feel it, to embody it. And this is not, in my experience, again, this is not an easy practice. It can be kind of scary. Um, I've avoided it a lot of my life. Who wants to be intimate with grief? Who wants to be intimate with hatred or fear? And there may be very good reasons why we don't want to be intimate with it, why we want to keep our distance. So perhaps we were neglected or abused as children. And as a result, we have a deeply held belief that um, there's really not going to be there anybody for us to hold us if we allow ourselves to feel our suffering. If we really let go into our experience, we will be alone with our suffering with no way out. That was one of my... Um, Challenges, I guess is a good word, for many years. I grew up in a household where my, my mother died when I was quite young, and my father was incapable of uh, parenting, really, uh, because of his own grief. So for years in this practice, it was like, I don't want to go there. Um, it's not safe. Or we may carry intergenerational trauma the trauma of the historically oppressed indigenous peoples, African-Americans, Jews, Palestinians. These people all carry intergenerational trauma. Or we may have the trauma, the intergenerational trauma, perhaps, of poverty or of sexual abuse, perhaps, that went on for generations or other forms of violence. So the mere thought of allowing ourselves to feel the depths of our fear or despair, the felt sense of it, can activate our sympathetic nervous system. Like, I'm not going there. I'm going to get into the fight, flight, freeze response and into raw reactivity. I think we see that in spades in the world today. So I'm going to take a, a moment here and take a breath. So Ajahn Chah taught, Ajahn Chah again is the, is the Thai forest master of the last century. He taught that all we need to do is know and let go. Know and let go. But this can be difficult, as I've said, to touch into our own suffering and to let it go when we believe that our very survival as individuals and as a group perhaps is dependent upon fighting back. This is what we see right now in the Middle East. So I don't have an easy answer to this challenge. I just wanted to acknowledge it because sometimes I think, I don't know, it, it can seem too simple. It's not simple. But sometimes when the conditions are right, uh, when we do feel safe enough to let go into our felt experience, it can be such a relief. Such a relief to feel the mind let go, the body relax and the heart open. And this points to the equally import, important part of disarming our hearts and minds, which is to notice what it feels like when we are able to do that, when we're able to let go. What is the felt sense of release, of freedom from suffering? This is equally as important. So Gil Fransdahl, another favorite teacher, he teaches in, uh, in California. He started out as a Zen teacher. He now teaches in the insight tradition. And he provided a great description of what this feels like the relief of having 
released our suffering. This is, these are his words. We can see the Buddhist emphasis on what is gained through letting go by how the tradition understands renunciation. I've always hated the word renunciation. <laughs> he didn't say that, I did. Uh, <laughs> while the English word implies giving something up, the Buddhist analogy for renunciation is to go out from a place that is confined and dusty into a wide open, clear space. So he's a Pali scholar. He knows what he's talking about. The Buddhist analogy for renunciation is to go out from a place that is confined and dusty into a wide open, clear space. It is as if you have been in a one room cabin with your relatives, snowed in for an entire winter. He's not even from Minnesota. While you may love your relatives, what is gained when you open the door and get out into spring probably feels exquisite. I think this is, for those of us who are in Minnesota, this is something that we can really appreciate this metaphor. So it's moving out from this confined one room cabin into spring. And like uh, the knowing of suffering, um, knowing the absence of suffering is not a concept or an idea. It too is a felt sense. We might feel it as ease in the body. We might feel it as free flowing energy of joy. We might feel it as a spaciousness in the mind. It is the experience of freedom after being confined by suffering. And so what are the conditions that allow this to happen? That provide a safe enough environment to risk disarming our hearts. For me, I think a large part of the answer, and I'll go back to where I began, is spiritual friends, is Sangha. Now you might look at me and think, well, I'm not your friend, but actually we are, we are, we are fellow travelers on the path, and that makes us spiritual friends. We may not have had the conditions as children that were necessary to be able to relax into the felt sense of our suffering easily, but with enough presence and practice and the support of others, we can begin to feel that support. We can begin to let go and to find peace. So when asked what would ensure the continuation of the Dharma, the Buddha named the fourfold Sangha. Monks, nuns, lay male practitioners, and lay female practitioners. We don't have to do this by ourselves. We have one another. So that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. And I would love to hear what you have to say. Before I do that, I'm going to read a poem that speaks to this. This is by Martha Postle, Postlewaite. Maybe that's how you pronounce it. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. I'll read it again. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. So thank you for your patience and your listening. And um, so I'm just open it up. I would invite you if you have any experience of your own of um, 
connecting to the felt sense of your own suffering and what your what your experience was of that or your resistance to that or the felt sense of the freedom from suffering or anything else that you'd like to share. Oh, we would love to hear it, your spiritual friends. Um, yeah, so I'll open it up. So those in the room, um, I'll try to repeat back what you said so those on Zoom can hear it. And those on Zoom, how should we do that? Um, they can speak and, and I'll just turn it on. Okay. And we can use this hand up. Oh, okay. All right. So does anybody have any um, reflections of their own or any of their own um, experiences with really going deeply into the felt sense of suffering and the freedom from suffering? In the back, yeah. Catherine. Um, recently, I lost a friend um, to anorexia, and um, and then my cat died the same week. And um, I never kind of expressed grief in that way, uh, where I just allowed myself to feel it and sob. And I'm an artist and a cartoonist, so I need a lot of comics and art about it. And it was really remarkable to me how incredibly painful it was but then I also shared some of the comments like on social media and I got so much wonderful feedback and it moved through me so quickly mm. in a way that I never felt before that like the intensity but then the processing and I and then felt guilty for how quickly <laughs> for me like, I'm dealing with the guilt of it it was just like oh wow just creating more suffering <laughs> Huh. But um, I just wanted to share that because I, I just was thinking about how I can bring that more into smaller griefs in life, you know, that ability to kind of process it and move on. Thank you. That's beautiful. And it's interesting to see the, re the reactivity to it, like the, the guilt. Yeah, just a thought. Yeah, moving through the mind. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll say something. Um, I like your comments about exhaustion mm -hmm. and the freedom to feel the exhaustion of suffering because I think we resist exhaustion a lot. Mm -hmm. And I heard about letting go one time that it there's actually an element of surrender, giving up. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you release as though you just release your grip. Mm -hmm. But there is an element of surrender, which I relate to your word disarmament. Mm. disarming yourself mm. so I found your words really threaded together very beautifully for me thank you mm. thank you thank you yeah yeah. yeah yeah this is great yeah very nice and it's lovely to be able to see you too we can all see you thank you anyone else So the, the transformation of pain and suffering into the beautiful, wholesome quality of compassion through, through the willingness to be with it. Thank you. So um, thank you for your contributions. Is there anyone else? Maybe we'll take one more if there's anyone that would like to speak. Uh, so the question, what is my experience of the exhaustion of suffering? Um, and I was saying that for me, just having it named was a relief. It's like, this really is exhausting. Despair is exhausting. Grief is exhausting. But, but also... Um, uh, so when we're when we're able to recognize that we're exhausted, then the 
the helpful response is to rest, to take care of ourselves, to um, to sleep if we're deprived of sleep or whatever it is. So there's a um, there's a letting go and a surrendering that that comes with it, and uh, and that's been my experience. Uh, what I can really feel again the felt sense, the energy of exhaustion around the suffering, there's a certain relief in it. That, that's my experience. That helps. Thank you. So I thought we we might um, shift a little bit now and um, uh, send some uh, love into the world by um, chanting. Um, I like chanting because again, it is there's a felt sense of chanting. There's a vibrational field that gets set up with chanting. Uh, but we could chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness together. We'll chant them together in this room. If you're on Zoom, if you would re remain on mute because when everybody unmutes themselves, it's cacophony. Um, but you're going to put it up on chat, correct? And on page 28 of your chant book is the Buddha's words on loving kindness. So I'll just say one word about this. So you may be familiar with the practice of loving kindness through the repetition of phrases. Um, this is a different way of accessing it. Um, you know, the phrases were developed hundreds of years after the death of the Buddha. And for many people, they work very well. I've never really resonated with them. I love this chant because I have access to the aspiration towards um, unconditional friendliness and love. Uh, I have access to it through this chant that I don't access through the phrases. So uh, we each have to find our own way in. And Robin has volunteered to... <laughs> to actually lead the chant because my chanting voice is not something you want to listen to and um so i'll just say if you're if you're not familiar with chanting the little marks on the page indicate when the voice goes down or when it goes up so the carrot going up means you raise up a tone if it's facing down you go down if there's an underline it means you uh you're holding that word a little longer, if that makes any sense. But Robin will lead us. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright straightforward and gentle in speech humble and not conceited contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their way Peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease whatever living beings there may be whether they are weak or strong omitting none the great or the mighty medium short or small 
the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness, over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will whether standing or walking seated or lying down free from drowsiness one should sustain this recollection this is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you. So I uh, I wanted to share before I say that. Um, I think this is actually a really um, helpful thing in the, in these times that we're living in to to take a moment and maybe chant this sutta maybe every day or every week or however uh, however many times you can do it. For me, I find it's a great solace. I uh, I once did a retreat in which, um, now I'm blocking on her name. Uh, darn, that's what happens when you have an old brain. Um, well, anyways, a well-known teacher at Spirit Rock was on the same floor with me. And every morning I'd walk by her room and she would be chanting the Metta Sutta. The name will come to me when I'm in bed tonight, uh, may, maybe before we end. But um, so it can be it can be very healing for our hurting hearts. All right, what is her name? Um, little woman, uh, Jewish, uh, wrote, wrote books about being Jewish and Buddhist. Sylvia Borstein. Yes, thank you. Sylvia Borstein. It was Sylvia Borstein. <laughs> um, thank you. I knew someone would get it. So I wanted to share a, um, I think, a beautiful expression of um, spiritual friendship from a Jewish synagogue that is in Minneapolis, Shir Tikva. Maybe you know it. So this is their prayer for peace. In these days of escalating rhetoric and spiraling violence, may compassion triumph over brutality. 
Let us be brave enough to examine the root causes and broader context of this violence. Even in these hardest times, let us invest in working toward a just and shared future in which every person is able to live in dignity and safety without fear. We are a community of people working actively for justice, liberation, healing, and transformation. Let us live out our sacred task as a spiritual community. Let us counter the instinct to draw sharp lines between us with our curiosity, humility, and compassion. May we comfort the mourners, visit the sick and weary, work for peace, and turn towards each other and insist on our shared humanity. May we comfort the mourners, visit the sick and weary, work for peace and turn towards each other and insist on our shared humanity. So why don't we end with what's called um, sharing the merit? It's, a, it's another version of what Shir Tikva has shared. So sharing the merit is um, sending out uh, whatever goodness may have arisen in our practice together and our being here, sharing it out to all beings everywhere. So taking a moment now to settle in once again to a comfortable seated posture or lying down posture. Connecting once again to the felt sense of the body. The solidity of the body. The weight of the body. This is the earth element in the body. and feeling the earth element in the body rest on the earth below. We are made of the earth and we'll go back to the earth, earth resting on earth. And feeling the breath in the body the breath coming into the body and the breath leaving the body. This breath that is shared by all of us. We are breathing into the same space, even the virtual space. We're breathing into that with our practice. Breathing in and breathing out. And as we do so, recognizing that our practice is not only for ourselves, for our own liberation, for our own freedom. Our practice is for the liberation and freedom of the world, for all beings everywhere. So recognizing and feeling whatever goodness may have arisen from our being together tonight as spiritual friends, of our exploring the Dharma, of our exploring the path to freedom, dedicating whatever goodness may ever has arisen to the well-being of all beings everywhere, being seen and unseen, being small and large. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. May all beings everywhere know peace.
So thank you for your um, kind attention and thank you for the Zoomers and for everyone in the room. And we have about, oh, wait a minute, excuse me. We, we've got a few announcements and, um, and if we have any extra minutes at the end then I would invite you to um, connect again with someone in the room. So, um, did you want to, yeah. Hi, I'm Chuck, your program host, with a word on Donna. First, Jean, thank you for your teachings and your work before these teachings to bring these here. Um, for myself, I think of three things with Donna. Uh, the first is that since 1993, as many, many people know, the center's offered all of its teachings for free. The second thing is they're all offered for free. Can your heart feel that? Uh, when I heard that first one, I thought, as a business owner, how's that going to work? But somehow it has since 1993, at least to date. And it took a while for me to really feel something given in a non-transactional way, something really for free. And I think the wish, my understanding, the, the, the desire of the center is to have this land in your heart and see what happens. Not the thinking part of us, but the heart part. And then maybe sometime later, the heart will respond in a way that fits for your circumstance to give back to something else or to give back to the center. So that's the challenge for me in this culture is to listen to the heart. That's the end of the Chuck Donna three-step story. <laughs> the uh, other part is there's ways to contribute um, to the center, even you know, to volunteer or to, uh, to uh, give money. for when, when we have guest speakers, two-thirds of the funds go to the teacher, one-third goes to the center. But uh, from, from my heart to yours, you know, when, when something comes up and the word is should, I don't trust that. That's not, that's not from my heart, at least. So, so, yeah, don't take this as an ask. Take this as a blessing from the center. Beautiful. And we had a gorgeous uh, example of Donna tonight with Robin. Uh, managing the technology so beautifully and leading the chant. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks again for, to all of you for coming. <laughs>